Well, thank. Is this on? Can you hear me? All right. Well, thank you for the very generous introduction, and thank you to my fellow panelists for being here today. So one thing that I spoke with Liz Dunbar about when I saw her in the elevator at City Hall the other day, we talked about this upcoming conference. And I, we talked about how excited we were, and I asked her a question because I said, well, who's going to be here? Is it going to be the choir? Are we going to preach to the choir, to the people who we know support immigrants, support refugees, and really are in tune with what we want to do? And we both said, yes, we are. And I remember thinking to myself, I wish we could talk to some folks who don't even belong to our congregation. And I'm going to share with you an example of why. So you may guess that as mayor, I get a variety of communications from people. <laughs> not always glowing. Actually, most of the time not glowing. But I took a picture of this because I wanted to just really emphasize the climate in which we're in. Dear Mayor Strickland, I'm writing as a property owner and a taxpayer of the city of Tacoma. Now, whenever I hear that introduction, I think to myself, yay, we have something in common. <laughs> I am appalled at the filth and graffiti that has overcome our city. I challenge you to drive over to neighborhood X and see the layer of garbage along every segment of the roadway adorning all of our millions of dollars of road work. The tolerance by the city for this behavior is just wrong, and it makes Tacoma a low-class alternative to Seattle and Bellevue. I become even more concerned when I see idiocy, like declaring Tacoma a welcoming city, when the filth and graffiti <coughs> is concentrated in those areas occupied by those illegals. Why do we want more of this? Whatever happened to good old-fashioned chain gangs? Why can't we demand that the bums work litter patrol for their public assistance. Why aren't you aggressively pursuing this? Stop wasting our tax dollars on garbage like Welcoming City and start cleaning up the mess and enforcing the law in this city. Thank you, Citizen X. So I'm going to spare you his name, but this is the kind of correspondence that I'm getting today at City Hall. And I think more than ever it emphasizes two things. Those of us who support programs like Welcoming Cities and our immigrant and refugee population, we need to triple down on the work. But it also says that there is a need to have conversations like grown folks with people who don't belong to our congregation. So I understand that Councilmember Campbell was here with you earlier today, and he talked about the Welcoming City. <laughs> and he had attended a leadership conference with the National League of Cities and brought back this idea back in 2015. And this idea did not come about because there is a federal detention center in our Tide Flats, nor did it come about because in 2015, we anticipated the election of the current administration. It came about because we are a kind, compassionate community that treats all people with respect and dignity. And there's a very practical purpose about this. I often talk about the fact that Tacoma's population from 2000 to 2010 only increased in our region by an anemic 2.5% when the growth throughout the entire metropolitan region was 13%. So there is a reason that people are not choosing Tacoma. Now, some of it had to do with schools, some of it had to do with sprawl, but some of it had to do with the reputation of this city. And I remember thinking to myself, well, what can we do to make the city more attractive to more people? And of course, they're the things that all mayors try to do. We want to make a community more safe. We want to attract more jobs. We want to clean up neighborhoods, et cetera. But there's also a way to position ourselves as a place where we know people want to go. And that was why when Councilmember Campbell approached me with the Welcoming City proposal, I wholeheartedly endorsed it, because I think it's a great idea. Now, some people in this climate have said to me, well, welcoming city is all good and well, but you're not going far enough. Tacoma must declare itself a sanctuary city. And I respect the cities that have done that, but I believe that we in Tacoma don't have to do what other cities do just to follow their lead, and also that we have to do what's best for our city. And I'm more focused on the actions that we take and the policies we have in place than the declaration of a name. And I point out that some of the horrible things that happened in the past few days all took place in New York, LA, and Seattle. 
all declared sanctuary cities that had nothing that had no control over the actions of immigration enforcement. So in Tacoma, I would rather have us focus on the work that we actually do as opposed to a declaration of something without the policies to back it up. So Tacoma is a welcoming city, and I'm very proud of that. Oh my goodness. So we approved this resolution there are 70 cities around the country that call themselves welcoming cities, and you're gonna hear from Dayton later. And it's pretty simple. We support newcomers and we are committed to building a community that fosters integration, that allows people to realize their full potential and fully participate in our society, period. Now, what does it mean? When we talk about our priorities as a city, we provide city services to all residents, regardless of immigration status. So if you want to come into City Hall to seek services, we will give them to you. If you want to sign up for power, for water, for Click Network, to get your garbage picked up, we will provide that for you. If you need to call 911 because you have an emergency, you should be allowed to do that and not fear any repercussions. And the Tacoma Police Department has a long-standing practice of not inquiring about immigration status when they interact with the public. So if someone is interacting with the police, we're not checking ID or looking for immigration status. Now if you're interacting with the police, there might be a good reason, there might be a bad reason, but you will be treated the same way you are treated with, by someone who's native born. So there's no discrimination that goes on among people who are immigrant regardless of their status. Now, one of the things that we have done as a city, thank you to the leadership of Council Member Lauren Walker, who's back with us, was really took a hard look at race and ethnicity and how that affects the way we provide services. So we have created an Office of Equity and Human Rights. And it means that we look at our services and how we provide resources through the lens of equity, every decision that we make. We recently received a grant from the US Department of Commerce to set up a minority business development agency center at City Hall. And when we were making the case for why that was important, one of the things we pointed out is that a lot of entrepreneurs are immigrants. So we wanna make sure that we have services available for all people that allow them to succeed to the best of their ability. We also have our website and outreach materials in many languages as well. So the photograph that you see at the bottom really shows that we are a welcoming city. We want to make sure that everyone is brought into the fold to participate in our community, but also too, as a government agency, that we provide services to all people and we do not discriminate based on immigration status. So Liz Dunbar and I actually <laughs> co-authored an opinion piece which talked about a scenario where a woman was at one of our big box stores and was treated very badly. And it talked about the commitment that is required of all of us when we call ourselves a welcoming city. Government can make that declaration, and that's good and well, but we need the business community to step up, we need our nonprofit community to step up, and we need people to speak out when they're hearing bigotry and hate that seems to be normalized these days. After the election, <clears throat> We passed a resolution reaffirming our city's commitment to equity and inclusion. And then Liz and I wrote this op-ed afterwards. And I also want to talk about the practical aspects of why immigrants are important to a city. Immigrants actually commit less crime compared to native-born folks. They are more likely to start businesses. They tend to be more family-oriented and tend to be people of faith. These are folks we want in our community for good reason, and that's a very strategic, intentional act on the part of the city of Tacoma if we wanna grow our population, grow small businesses, and be known for a place that is welcoming. Project Peace is with the police department where we actually tried to be proactive to avoid a scenario like Ferguson so that we interacted with folks from different walks of life, different backgrounds, to make sure that policing in Tacoma is community-based. It's hard to have a good relationship with immigrant communities when they fear that you're gonna check their immigration status. So to make our community more safe and to make sure that the police department has good relationships with communities of color, we engaged in Project Peace. And I also wanna point out too, that when we talk about immigrant communities, 
they belong to people from all over the world. I think for some folks, when they think of the conversation about immigration, it is a group of people who only speak one language. We know that there is a huge global presence of people from around the world right here in the city, and we have a responsibility to make sure that they can fully participate in our community. We also had Latino town halls. And we wanted to make sure that the people of Latino descent in our city have the opportunity to fully participate as well. And here's what's interesting. Some of the outcomes or some of the findings that we had were pretty interesting to me. The top two findings, and Lisa, you can check me on this, people said that they wanted more access to English language classes. And it kind of debunks that whole myth when you hear people say, you need to learn English. It's like, actually, people do want to learn English. They get it. But we need to provide more opportunities for people to learn the language. And then the other thing was interesting to me was better access to health care. Getting access to health care and dental care was one of the issues that rose to the top when it came to the needs of our Latino community. The Lincoln District is the district in South Tacoma that is bordered by Lincoln High School and has businesses from people from Asia and Southeast Asia. And we have made several attempts to try and reach out to the business group, but then a light went on and someone said, let's hire someone from City Hall who speaks the language. So we've opened up an office there and we are getting participation from these businesses in a way that we never had. And in the next few years, you'll start to see revitalization happening in the Lincoln Business District. We didn't want to swoop in and gentrify it. We wanted people to maintain their culture and the beautiful patina of the culture, but we want to make sure that the Lincoln District becomes a destination for shopping and dining, just like the Proctor District, just like Point Ruston. And then we formed an immigrant and refugee task force, which is really going to be our opportunity to talk to this diverse <coughs> group of people and find out what policies need to be put in place and what practices need to be put in place so that we can further assist them and help them be part of our community in a more meaningful way. Again, policies, actions, practical work not just a label. So Tacoma is a welcoming city because it makes economic sense, because it makes sense for us to have a safer community, because it shows that we are kind and compassionate, and it helps us live up to our promise of being a better community that treats all people with respect and with dignity. Thank you. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Melissa Bertolo, and I'm the Welcome Dayton Program Coordinator with the City of Dayton Human Relations Council. I want to thank particularly University of Washington Tacoma, the Urban Studies Department, for having me here today. This is my first time in Washington, and I'm really excited to be able to stay the weekend. So. Tacoma. <laughs> um, so I, I want to share a little bit about the work that we do in the Human Relations Council because I think it provides a lot of context for why Welcome Dayton was started and why we as a city also decided to become a welcoming community. Um, so the work that we do in the Human Relations Council really is built out of the civil rights era. We were established in 1962, and a main focus of our work is civil rights enforcement. The other divisions that we have are business and technical assistance, so we're very much also focused on economic justice. We set um, contract, or excuse me, we set contract goals for uh, city projects related to minority and women-owned and locally disadvantaged locally disadvantaged businesses. And then our third area of work is community relations, really making sure that we are creating a, a community that is safe and inclusive. And so with that is where Welcome Dayton lies. And then we also have a community initiative to reduce gun violence and also a community police council to again, ensure that our community police relations are strong and positive in Dayton. And I mention all of that because the work of Welcome Dayton, I think, as, as it being part of a city government, in some ways is, is definitely odd. You don't hear, honestly, very many in, until you until this movement has begun, there weren't very many cities or municipalities engaging in immigrant integration work. Um, and I, quite honestly, did not even know about the Human Relations Council until I was hired for this position. But I think as far as really understanding the context that all of these things are touching on our immigrant community and when we're looking at marginalization and oppression in a community, how, where is that intersection with race and immigration status as well? And so that's, I'd like to highlight that aspect as far as where, where 
where are we situated within the city government? And I think it's really wonderful that the city of Tacoma also has this office of equity and human rights, because it's also very similar. And I think that for a city to truly be a welcoming community, you have to have an emphasis on economic and social justice. So Welcome Dayton began in 2011 um, for two kind of primary reasons of things that were happening within our community. Um, one is that our Human Relations Council Board was doing research that focused specifically on discrimination, particularly in housing, against our Latino and also our African refugee communities, and found, unfortunately, that they were being discriminated against, but also that they weren't coming to us for a lot of different reasons. There's mistrust of government. We had poor language access. Um, people didn't know about our services. And so all of those were a multitude that, that created this atmosphere where discrimination, unfortunately, was happening against our immigrant community. Additionally, at that same time, or between 2000 and 2010, the city of Dayton experienced um, some demographic changes. So between those years, we had more than a 50% increase in our foreign-born community. Neighborhoods were being revitalized, homes were being bought, and um, we really <coughs> suffered, I was sharing with a um, table mate over lunch, that we, we experienced some of our hardest downturn during that time period, and yet all of a sudden we, we see um, economic growth, we see neighborhoods being revitalized, we see a decrease in crime in those neighborhoods with a higher immigrant uh, population. And so thinking about that, it's a, a big juxtaposition for a city to start to contemplate. What are we doing? How do we make sure that those immigrants that are truly um, benefiting everyone in the community by choosing Dayton to be their home are not going to leave our city because they're also being discriminated against? And as the Human Relations Council, we had a very, very important role to play to make sure that everyone is welcomed, that everyone is included, and that um, everyone is going to benefit by having more diversity in our community. And so as a result of that, the Human Relations Council led a series of four community conversations to start asking the question, what would it look like if we were to intentionally become an immigrant-friendly city? And I think that's something that's also very important as well and was touched on in the earlier panel, this intentionality. This isn't just something where you can put out the welcome mat and say, okay, great, you know, we did it. But you really have to start thinking about what are your engagement efforts? Just as the mayor had mentioned, oh, we need someone who, who speaks the language and who represents these communities in order for us to really do that outreach. And so similarly, one of our big successes is that we've hired two immigrant resource specialists who are members of the immigrant communities and have those direct relationships and networks and are able to really do the outreach and education around civil rights, around economic inclusion, so that we can have the outcomes that we're looking for. So the, the history, to go back to that point, excuse me, um, <clears throat> we had these four community conversations around what would it look like if we were to intentionally become an immigrant-friendly city? What do we need to do? And I think the, the two things that really came out of that for us as a city is that it's something that cannot be city-led or driven entirely. There needs to be the leadership and the backbone of a government and of a municipality, but it also really needs to be driven by the community they are going to be the experts in the room. And so we have to listen to those voices and make sure that they are being included and recognized so that we can have that opportunity um, to actually create an immigrant-friendly city. Um, and the, the other piece that I think was incredibly important about those community conversations is that it also allowed for people to talk about their fears and hesitancies. So when the city of Dayton adopted Welcome Dayton, it was 2011, which unfortunately the climate was probably better then than it is today. Um, and it was actually d during the time of SB 1070 in Arizona and a lot of similar copycat legislation of show me your papers types of um, laws. And, and yet, so people were very fearful about the type of backlash that this could have. And I think that it was very important for us as a community to talk about what are those fears and hesitancies so that, you know, if we are to de declare ourselves a sanctuary city, for example, that we're not going to be then targeted by an ICE enforcement raid um, for simply making that declaration because we don't have that ab ability to, to maintain um, or to say to ICE to not come into our community. And so I think that those are really important conversations. And I'm really proud of the city of Dayton that, that we had those types of conversations in our community. Um, and so what resulted from those is what's called the Welcome Dayton Plan. And it essentially said these are the things that the city government needs to be responsible for. And these are the things that we as a community need to be responsible for. And it really outlined <clears throat> a framework for us. And so we have five different focus areas that were a result of that. 
And I'll run through them quickly, but all of this is on our website, welcomedean.org. Um, so it's community culture and arts. It is um, education, government and justice, health and social services, and business and economic development. And so when we think about immigrant integration, we have to be looking at it holistically. It's not going to be the silver bullet, as um, the keynote speaker had mentioned. You know, we're not just looking at economic um, a driver for revitalization in our community. But it's also not just looking at immigrants and, and refugees as those that need help and service, um, that, that there's a lot of benefit behind all of these um, aspects. And so looking at Im in immigrant integration very holistically um, is one thing that came out in those five focus areas. The other piece that came out is really understanding that immigrant integration is a two-way street. And so we have this opportunity, yes, you know, immigrants and refugees are going to be learning English and they're going to learn American laws and all of those things, but it's also what are we as what we call the receiving community doing to reflect back that diversity and celebrate it and make sure that there's, again, that mutual recognition um, that inclusion uh, within our community. So we um, have been doing this since 2011, and I was hired in 2012 as the first full-time employee to work on this Welcome Dayton initiative as, as a full-time city employee. And so some of the things that I wanted to talk about are metrics of success. What does that really look like? Which is certainly a very challenging component because some of these things are more abstract um, and more qualitative than quantitative. And so some of the things that we've looked at are um, increase in citizenship, but again, recognizing, unfortunately, that not all of our community has that opportunity or that pathway to citizenship, but that's one, one metric that we're looking at. Um, the other metric that we're looking at is change in welcoming attitudes amongst our community members. So it, it, it's a real narrative shift that has to be occurring. You have to be working at the institutional level, but you also have to be working at the individual level. And so with that, um, how, do we, how do we make sure that our community members, who are really going to be the neighbors and the ones doing the welcoming, how are we making sure that we're making that shift? So we've been doing some research um, over the past few years on an annual basis to ask uh, community members, how are they feeling about immigrants who are who are moving into their community? Um, and then the, um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. The the final piece that we're looking at as far as a metric of success is our, in, our general increase in immigrant population. And so Dayton has had continued to had an, have an increase in our foreign-born population. So I mentioned between 2000 and 2010, it increased by 50%. Again, between 2009 and 2013, it increased by 60%. So we're continuing to see this. And one of the things that we've really seen is a an increase in our secondary migrant population. So those folks that have lived elsewhere in the United States and are now making a very profound decision to call Dayton home. A lot of that has to do with social connections, having family and friends who are living in, in Dayton and are, are calling them and telling them Dayton's a nice place to live, it's affordable, it has you know, great access to education and employment. Um, and so that's really been our attraction strategy is not to necessarily say that we need to, you know, have flyers and go out to these other communities or, or go to other countries and trying to recruit people, but really how do we foster a community that is truly welcoming so that those that are already living in Dayton are going to tell their family and friends that Dayton is a is a place that you can come and live. So I can share um, a lot about the our particular strategies, the things that we're doing on the ground, um, but my time's up, so maybe we'll get to that in questions and answers. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rich Stoltz. I'm the executive director of One America, uh, which has its headquarters in Seattle, but we're a statewide organization working um, on immigrant and refugee issues, organizing advocacy um, in communities across the state and in Olympia and on federal issues as well. I thought I might begin with just a couple reflections on uh, what people are feeling, um, and this perhaps resonates with a lot of your experiences in the room. Um, but earlier this week I had um, a coffee with a, a, a member of the community who is Muslim, and he was reflecting on the experience of his 17-year-old son who basically said, uh, um, you know, that he didn't realize how Muslim he was <laughs> um, until, uh, until the presidential campaign really came into focus last year. And that's an experience among a lot of immigrant and refugee communities right now. The, uh, the feeling of being otherized, um, the feeling of being uh, 
pointed out um, and, uh, and targeted. And, uh, and this, that's part of the context. Build on that, um, the fact that earlier this week, um, it was announced that um, um, a student who, uh, a young man with DACA uh, was arrested and taken to the Northwest Detention Center by ICE. Uh, there is a hearing before federal court tomorrow morning and uh, we'll see what happens next. But what was striking was um, given this broader narrative about uh, the criminality and uh, the issue of terrorism being um, labeled on immigrant and refugee communities, uh, it was not surprising that ICE refused to admit their error and instead doubled down on um, announcing through media statements that the individual in question uh, admitted to being a member of the gang. When the attorneys um, have been very clear that he was coerced by ICE into admitting a gang affiliation. That will be uh, debated in court, but um, I think it's important to understand the context that um, uh, we're living at a time where <clears throat> most of the actions of the federal government um, under Trump's, President Trump's leadership is uh, being justified by language around uh, criminality and terrorism and national security. And uh, it's a tough environment in which to live. Um, and just last night into the late hours, um, there were nu numerous reports and calls about um, ICE um, checkpoints and raids, people really trying to figure out what was happening. But I think our sense is what was actually happening was ICE was uh, tracking down individuals using um, voter registration data to identify their vehicles um, and, uh, and pulling people over in a targeted way, then picking up whoever they could um, that happened to be in the same parking lot or on the street or in a nearby store or restaurant. And so that's, that's our sense of what happened, but it's, it's a little confusing as to exactly how it happened. But reports were coming from um, a number of uh, communities throughout South King County. And uh, others are reporting door-to-door uh, uh, -door, um, uh, stops um, by ICE in communities like Walla Walla and elsewhere where um, um, you know, there, there is a lot of fear and concern um, in our communities. Um, so that is the context. So it's, uh, it's important to understand that this is happening because in the world I'm in, it's often striking how separate and different and far away that experience is than the typical experience of a, of a Washington resident um, who may not think about any of that at all or may have even realized that uh, there is a flood of um, postings across Facebook with people trying to figure out, is it safe to go home right now? Um, so it's just important to remember that. <clears throat> In that context, you know, comments or statements or um, um, frameworks around welcoming or even sanctuary are very important because it has important symbolic meaning. But like some of the speakers earlier today, I'm very interested in, so what does it actually mean? Um, in fact, when uh, folks had approached us uh, a few years back saying they wanted King County to be a welcoming county, our response was, well, don't, don't, just, don't just sign a resolution. Let's figure out what you're actually gonna do. Um, so when I think about welcoming regions or communities, I often think about um, matters of culture. Um, how are we lifting up numerous cultures, um, relationships, how are there being relationships built across communities? Um, how intentional those strategies and approaches are? And, uh, and civic engagement and community involvement is critical. Um, the voices of communities themselves, um, religious, um, uh, immigrant status, race, are critical to making sure that any discussion with regard to welcoming or sanctuary or whatever term you choose to use is authentically grounded in the experience of immigrant and refugee communities, and that's absolutely essential. Um, task forces and other mechanisms, I think, are useful to that end in terms of formalizing those structures and processes, but digging beneath that, um, it's so important to make sure there's much more going on than you know, the folks that get tapped or picked to represent you know, communities that are much broader and diverse than what any single person can actually represent um, on any such task force. Um, I'll take a moment to just talk through some issues that um, we've been focusing on over the last few years, um, sort of in this wheelhouse of integration and education policy. <clears throat> um, what exists in Washington State and uh, what different folks are developing. And I'll mention that there's a lot of uh, great um, experimentation and work happening throughout Washington State that um, I'm you know, very proud of <laughs> and uh, want to see more of. In the context of education, um, 
uh, <clears throat> it's often not discussed in a very deep way in a welcoming context because um, education policy is often outside the purview of cities. Um, but it's difficult to, it's impossible to, um, to overstate the importance of our schools and the role they play in, um, in immigrant integration and in, um, creating opportunities for, for young people and their parents um, um, through family literacy programs and other resources to really um, improve their prospects um, as families in our communities. Um, so the number of strategies that exist here in Washington State, um, one area of focus that we've centered on is respect for home language. So statewide policies like the seal of biliteracy, dual language instruction strategies at the early learning level through K, the K through 12 level, um, other approaches that really value the, the assets, the value of language that individuals and families bring to our communities is essential. Um, it's also important to, to fundamental elements of self-esteem and there is a growing body of research that demonstrates that dual language strategies and approaches that value people's um, home language actually improve people's um, children's outcomes in the schools. Workforce development, somebody mentioned the classic story of uh, and, uh, economic development was described earlier, so I won't dig into that because of limited time, but workforce development really matters too. Folks have mentioned um, the taxi cab driver that also happens to be a PhD in physics or <laughs> structural engineering. Um, our workforce development system, and this is one place where I think there's a significant gap. Um, you know, folks have mentioned the need for more ESL classes and more ways of doing ESL. Um, there is, a, I think, in my opinion, a significant gap in how <clears throat> our um, workforce development systems throughout Washington State approach um, language, skill sets, and help individuals who come to this country with skills integrate in the workforce at wage levels that they um, can actually earn if they had the opportunity, the social capital, and the relationships to find those jobs <clears throat> um, without having to start all over again at a community college. Um, I think that is very important. Law enforcement is another significant area of policy, and I think we've talked in various ways about <clears throat> how, do, um, how law enforcement agencies can focus their attention on truly keeping communities safe by not enforcing or col collaborating with uh, federal immigration authorities. Um, it's important uh, to, to really hone in on that because not only is there that, um, but there are also significant collateral issues related to involvement in the criminal justice system, whether, um, whether or not you're convicted, that may have significant impacts on immigrants and their ability to become citizens later on, adjust their status, um, and, uh, and can lead to their deportation, particularly under the recent executive orders um, announced by this president. Um, I also mention, um, kind of goes back to schools, but <clears throat> in other contexts, um, there is very little enforcement in this country um, around um, language access under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And I think, that's, I think it's safe just to state that that is true. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot of work happening in local communities trying to figure out how to raise resources to address these issues at the school level and local government and elsewhere. Um, but the matter of language access and um, supporting individuals to navigate their own way through our society um, that may not speak English well, that are limited English proficient individuals is a significant gap um, in so many different ways across um, local government. Everything ranging from um, individuals not being communicated with when um, fires are sweeping through their communities in Eastern Washington um, or you know, other examples um, around emergency preparedness or whatnot here in, uh, in Western Washington. Um, <clears throat> and access to services, folks mentioned healthcare, but there are a range of strategies um, that can be grounded in immigrant and refugee communities that can significantly improve outreach and assure that people have access and information about the services that they are eligible for. Um, so those are a number of things that I want to just flag in terms of what we think about. It's the collection of those kinds of strategies and the intentional focus on different areas of, of policy and intersections of the community um, that, in my mind, um, um, allow communities to earn the, uh, the title of being welcoming. Thank you, and uh, I realize that I am the last speaker, and uh, there's good and bad things about that. Uh, I have the benefit of hearing from everyone else, um, but also uh, know that uh, 
you've been sitting for a long time. So I'll try to keep my remarks really brief. Hope we can have some um, conversation. Um, I wanted to show this slide because it just illustrates what a lot of people have said today, um, that we're living in a very challenging time, challenging is an understatement, uh, for immigrants and refugees. They are threatened, they are harassed, they are uh, arrested, they are afraid, um, they are profiled, they are unwelcome. And that's the environment that we're in right now. Um, so we're here to talk about welcoming cities and welcoming regions in a time when people are feeling really unwelcome. And uh, so we, we, we have lots of challenges in front of us. Um, the, this region has a very mixed history in terms of its welcoming. And the mayor has spoken about this often, including when she um, introduced the Immigrant and Refugee Task Force at the city council meeting. So we've had a long history of immigration in this community but we've also have the history of Chinese exclusion and Japanese American internment and uh, uh, the detention center. So we, ha we have a really mixed history in this community. On the positive side, um, we have had a long history of uh, immigration into this region and very successful immigration. And I think uh, we've heard stories about that. Um, Sulja talking about her own personal story and about the Korean Women's Association. Um, we've had Tacoma Community House for 107 years welcoming immigrants into the hilltop. And uh, we talked about immigrant entrepreneurs. Uh, before it was MLK Way, it was K Street, and that was all Italian shops because it was an Italian immigrant neighborhood. Um, Fawcett and Tacoma Avenues were Japantown, and those were all Japanese-owned businesses before World War II, before the internment. So we've had a long history of people um, coming as immigrants, um, starting their own businesses, integrating into the community, and eventually being welcomed. Um, we've had successive waves of immigrants into this community. The um, the Asian Wives of Servicemen that uh, Solja talked about, which is Marilyn's situation, my situation. Uh, so we know that there are lots of families like that. There are uh, the Southeast Asian refugees who came in 1975 <laughs> and were welcomed by the governor and by Pierce County. Uh, and then we've had other waves of, of immigrants and refugees who have come here. So our region is really diverse. We have in this South Sound area, we have people from over 100 different countries, immigrants and refugees. And at the community house, we see all of those folks um, and help them with all the things we've talked about, learning the language, getting a job, becoming citizens. And, and that's the work that we do every day. Um, we, and, and we can't keep up with the demand. Um, we have a two-month waiting list for uh, immigration appointments. We have a waiting list for our English classes that was already talked about. So there's a lot more interest um, by immigrants in wanting to integrate, in wanting to be part of this community than we have a capacity to respond to. And it's I'm, when I say we, I'm not just talking about Tacoma Community House, I'm really talking about the region. There is no organization like ours between here and Portland, Oregon. So there's a whole swath of Washington that just has no access to these services. Um, so we really need, um, we, we need to do more. Um, the city of Tacoma has done a lot, and you've heard about that both from Marty Campbell and from Mayor Strickland. Um, the city of Lakewood, interestingly, has done a number of things. They did an assessment of their community, identified that the Latino community was very underserved, and, and actually, uh, put out some funding for services um, to that community, and uh, in particular, domestic violence was a big issue, and they are, are now funding some services at our organization to help victims of domestic violence in Lakewood in particular. So they, they and they, they took that approach in just the ways that our keynote speaker and other people have talked about. Look at the data, listen to people, and then respond in a way that makes sense and is appropriate. And I think we just need to continue to do more of that. Um, and not just local governments. I uh, want to challenge, there are business people here today, and I want to challenge you 
uh, as members of the Chamber of Commerce, members of the Economic Development Board, members of the um, other business organizations, what can you do to make this a more welcoming region to support and encourage that immigrant entrepreneurship? Uh, those are things that we can do more and better than we have so far. Um, just to reiterate what other people have said, uh, listening is so important. Um, listening to the voices of immigrants and refugees themselves, hearing from them in their language so that they can really articulate what their their interests, their desires, their goals are, and what their needs are. Uh, it's not all about needs. There's lots of things they want to offer, and they need to be able to express that and have that heard and have that um, uh, accepted and, and involved. Um, Again, better responsiveness um, to services is so important, not only language, but cultural competency. Um, as Rich said, Title VI is not uniformly followed, and it is, is so critical. Um, I spent many years at Department of Social and Health Services, and we spent a lot of time, took a lot of work. It's not easy, but we built a system for providing interpreter services, providing information translated, providing culturally competent staff, and I, I just challenge um, whether it's school districts or, or local government agencies or businesses to, to step up to that and really make your, your service accessible and understandable to people. Um, I would also like to reiterate what um, Dr. Price said about uh, a call to action and things that you can do. Um, again, listening, learning, serving, and advocating are the ways that you can get involved and respond to all that you've heard today. So I would encourage you to learn more. Um, I'm going to. There are several opportunities to do that, and so these are up on the screen. I won't repeat them all, but there are a number of opportunities in our community for you to learn more about what's going on uh, with immigrants and refugees. So I encourage you to get involved in those things um, and to stand up for people. Um, and you can stand up in lots of different ways, whether it's writing a letter to the mayor that's different from that one she read, <laughs> whether it's writing a letter to the editor, um, whether it's uh, writing to your elected officials and advocating for policies, or whether it's standing next to that woman in the hijab who was being harassed in that store and just standing with her, um, that we need that. And I'm not suggesting that you um, confront the harasser. Um, that could be dangerous and probably counterproductive. But you can stand with that, those persons who are under attack and let them know that you support them and that they are welcome. Um, you can volunteer. There, uh, there are lots of organizations who could use your help. And uh, like I said, Andy Gernon uh, gave us a free advertisement earlier. Um, and we would welcome volunteers at Tacoma Community House in lots of different ways. But there are many other organizations as well. Uh, Lutheran Refugee Services resettles refugees here in, in this region. And because of the president's action, they are going to have to lay off most of their staff, and yet they still have refugees here. They could use volunteers to help them with resettlement. Uh, Aid to Immigrants in Detention Northwest, the advocacy organization for the detention center, they need volunteers and donations and help. So there's many ways that you can get involved and really be, as an individual, uh, welcoming and uh, encouraging to people in this community. Um, and of course, at the national level, we all need to be involved. Um, we have seen in the short time of this administration that um, people's responses are making a difference. Um, kudos to the state of Washington for fighting the, the travel ban and getting that stopped in court. We don't know if it'll be stopped permanently, but for now it is. Um, and we have seen other actions like that have an impact. So advocate, stand up, speak your mind, stand with immigrants and refugees, and then we truly will be a welcoming place. Thank you.
Thank you all for wonderful presentations. I have a million questions, and while you warm up to ask your questions, I'm going to offer you two questions, and you can choose either one or both to respond to. And I want to talk about metrics later on, so hopefully somebody will ask about how do we assess what we are doing and how do we measure that. So the two questions are already asked. One is, how do we move beyond preaching the choir? What steps does that take? I would love to hear from you on that. And the other one is the irony of a data. Uh, this morning when I presented the information, I showed you that foreign-born population disproportionately participate in healthcare. So why don't they have access to it? So I don't have an answer, so I'm just going to provide some guesstimates here. But I think we underestimate, as Rich pointed out, the language barrier and the amount of comfort that people feel. I mean, I know how to navigate the system, and I don't like using it. So imagine how much of a barrier is there for people who may not understand how the healthcare system works and how they navigate it. And I use my own personal story as an example. So my mother is 87 years old, and she is a patient at Madigan Army Medical Center, where she's a cardiac patient. I accompany her on every single visit, including the pharmacy and everything else. And if I were not there to help her navigate the system, she probably would have passed away a long time ago. So a lot of times it's about having an advocate beside you who knows how to navigate the system and knows how to ask questions. So as we talk about the conversation of access to health care, I think it's a language barrier, but it's also being able to provide people who can accompany folks to understand how to navigate the system. I'll answer this, the other question as far as how do you move beyond preaching to the choir because I think that's something that we've been really successful in Deaton with. Um, and I, I think particularly when you think about some of the facts and statistics that you have around immigration in the United States, there's still, it, it, the, the narrative, the popular narrative is still contrary to what we actually know as fact, right? The narrative continues to be immigrants are job takers, immigrants are drained on our public benefit system. And so I think a lot of it has, in order to, to move beyond um, the, the, the narrative that is so negative in our community is to really start to have opportunities to, for people to have meaningful personal experiences. Um, because that's really how you change hearts and minds. It's not facts and statistics, which I have plenty of and we all probably do in this room, but it's really about how do you connect someone with someone else who is different from them so that then they're able to say, oh, you know, geez, Immigrants are really a benefit for my community. Look, this person is a job creator, not a job taker. So I have three examples of things that we're doing specifically in Deaton around this. Um, one of them is we have a Welcome Deaton Ambassador Program because we know that in order to truly change people's minds and opinions, it's about relationships. I'm not going to be able to go talk to someone who's on that end of the spectrum that's hesitant, that's concerned um, about, about immigration. I don't have that relationship. And so what we do is we have an orientation with our Welcome Deaton Ambassadors. These are the choir, right? They're all of you in the room today. But we give you information about how do you have that, infor how do you have that conversation? How do you take what Welcome Deaton is doing into your own community so that you can start changing those hearts and minds? Um, we have a lot of very simple activities that we encourage people to do, to engage in, and to bring someone with them. So it could be anything from visiting a, a new immigrant-owned <laughs> restaurant or grocery store or a cultural festival um, to something deeper, which is the next thing that we're doing, is our Voices of the Immigrant Experience. And so these are community dialogues that are focused around people hearing an immigrant story. Um, and, and so our, our ambassadors, we encourage them to actually host these. But our model with this is that I don't ever hold these alone. Welcome Dayton does not host this because, again, if I host it, I'm going to be preaching to the choir. And so we always require a community partner to host. It's been challenging. I can tell you that our, our most recent one, we're having in, an, in a suburban school. And we were told by um, one of the city council members that this is a political event being hosted in, by the city of Deaton. And therefore, we have to provide our own writer insurance and blah, blah, blah. And, they don't, and it has to be very clear on the flyer that this is not um, part of the school district's activity. And so just the fact that someone sharing their personal story has now become a political activity, um, I think shows the type of climate that we're in, um, but also the importance of always doing these with a partner so that we can go deeper into the community. Because if we don't have those opportunities to reach people that I as Welcome Dayton am not going to do, then we won't start to change those hearts and minds. 
Um, and then the last event that, that we have is, is again, a, a community dialogue, but around the topic of is Islamophobia and racism. And again, the model of um, going deeper into the community and always having a community partner to host so that we can truly start to make that, that change. I'll focus on the second one, um, but uh, the second question. And uh, I guess in, in my mind, uh, there's a, a lot of work that, um, that has to be done. I think uh, um, there, are two, there, there are two things that, that we focus on or that I focus on. The first is around s storytelling. It's so valuable for, um, for immigrants and refugees themselves to share their own stories, uh, to create that empathy, to create that sense of understanding what the circumstances are by which they came, how they're living here. Um, it's just remarkable, um, you know, from the perspective of an immigrant, how little knowledge there is of the immigrant experience in the United States. Um, and it's equally important for non-immigrants to also be telling their own stories publicly about their relationship with immigrants themselves. Um, if we're not successful in, in conveying that, um, I worry that uh, we are just contributing to the sense of a, a bifurcated society. But I know that bifurcated society um, is not um, in concrete, because I, because I also know that there are conservatives, um, evangelicals, in the business community elsewhere um, who may have conservative views of the world and even of politics, but who do not feel comfortable with the nature of the national political discourse around immigration. Um, so there is an important opportunity at this point in time to really engage folks around, well, what are core beliefs <clears throat> and whether they're you know, willing to talk about Islamophobia or the importance of religious freedom. <laughs> you know, I think it's important to have those conversations with folks um, in, a, in a very meaningful way, particularly now. Yes, and I would uh, agree with that and, and say that um, I'm willing to go anywhere and talk to anyone <laughs> on this subject and share uh, some of those facts, try to do some myth busting, um, share those personal stories. Uh, we, we have some great videos, so often when I go out and do presentations, I am able to show video first-person stories of immigrants telling things from their perspective. So um, I would welcome an invitation, and I, like I said, I will go just about anywhere and talk to just about anyone and hope that uh, we can uh, reach across the divide and, uh, and, and have some real dialogue on these issues. Thank you. So we have about a half hour for Q&A. I ask you to come to the mic. We're going to do short questions and rapid responses, so as many people who want to ask questions, they can do that. So please. I'm going to respond to your prompt and ask what metrics we can see um, makes a difference. What kinds of things are making a difference in this region? That was the question that I didn't get to. So, so the question was, what metrics can we use so that we can actually measure progress or success, or what does success look like? So, so I would say that for me, given the realm that I'm in, one, one of the things that came out of the Latino town halls that I hear from a lot of different groups is that we should, that government and leadership in Tacoma should reflect the community that it serves. And in some places we're doing really well and in some places we are woefully underrepresented. And so I would hope to see a city council one day, and I think we're doing a good job now, that is a better reflection of the community we serve. When we appoint these 13 boards and commissions, we should adhere to that rule. But also, as we look at leadership in different civic organizations throughout the city, whether that's the chamber, the economic development board, the boards of directors of different organizations, because we have a community of nonprofit organizations, but if you lift up the lid and see who's running them and who's on the boards, we can do a much better job. So if I see progress in leadership that starts to look more like my city, then I'll think we can, we, we've been successful and we can measure that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just talked to Efrain who talked with Cat Flores today and 0.4 of the city's employees are Latino, 0.4. Yep. <laughs> Less than 1%. <laughs> we can do better. Yep. Um, I, I, I beg your pardon just to <clears throat> update my last Hang on, hang on one sec, there was one more response to that question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sure. So I just want to underscore the importance of making sure there are people in um, decision-making roles and um, in conversations that can reflect these issues because the metrics don't necessarily have to be consistent from place to place. So um, 
in ESL context, you know, there are a range of questions that a city can be asking itself or a workforce development <coughs> council can be asking itself that they're honestly not asking themselves right now. For example, um, you know, what is the demand and how is it being met? How long are people waiting to get into ESL classes? <laughs> um, what are the retention rates in ESL? Why are people um, so often not finishing their classes? Um, you know, there, there's so many different questions that don't get asked unless there are actually ESL students in the mix, <laughs> or ESL instructors, or other folks. And so that's just one example, but um, it does speak to the importance of the intentionality um, of, of fully engaging immigrant and refugee communities in designing some of these metrics. And then there are broad metrics. Um, so it is actually um, not hard to look up data that the schools gather in terms of the graduation rates of English language learners, for example, who are the um, you know, English learners of children of immigrant and refugees, you know, arriving in this country. Um, so, um, you know, how, <laughs> what does that look like compared to, to other populations? And depending on the place, um, in Washington State, it um, is often, um, sadly, <laughs> given other problems within the educational system, um, you know, in some, in some cases worse, um, but often close to, like, the rates of, um, Latino, non-immigrant kids, African-American children, it speaks to a much broader issues around race and equity um, within our educational system. But, um, but those are just a couple examples. But I think what matters just as much is, is the approach. Um, update on the Tacoma Slavery Center. I was quickly informed by Claire Petrich one of our resources in, in this life, um, on, the, um, on the Sister Cities Committee and also on the um, Port Commission, it is not Portland that the uh, Slavery Center is built on. And by the way, this fellow who uh, was just arrested and who's going to have a hearing is not three quarters of a mile away from here, right now. Seattle? ICE people arrested him, but they had to go to Tacoma, the center for deportation, in order to keep him. And after his hearing, he'll presumably be put back here, three quarters of a mile away from the university. It will be remembered when we rounded up the Japanese Americans in World War II. Does anybody know where that data came from? to round them up. Anybody know? It, it took until 1986 to back this agency into a corner and make them admit Can you, in the face of the, the Census Bureau. Question. Oh, okay, good question. Voter registration records, perfect. I would challenge the city to do something about our slavery center. And I would challenge the city also to identify ICE officers and make sure those people are publicly recognized. Who are they? Sir, is there a question? A challenge to the city. Okay, so I, this is an opportunity to um, provide some factual information. And as a descendant of slaves, the throwing around of that word to describe things is pretty deeply offensive. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> So there's always a cultural competency, competency moment for all of us to learn, even among allies. The Northwest Detention Center was put here as a result of terrorism that was starting to take place in the United States around 1996. Now the current site on the Tide Flats in Tacoma used to house a meat processing facility named High Grade. Some of you are old enough to remember that brand. At one point, the federal government was shopping for a site. So there were two sites in the port on the Tide Flats, and they chose this one. The property is privately owned, and the center is privately run by a for-profit prison corporation. So they make a profit off of the incarceration of these folks down there. They have a contract with the federal government. So as much as I wish I could just go there and say, be gone, it is a federal facility, and the city of Tacoma has no jurisdiction over it. 
And the reason that the people who were arrested by ICE ended up in the federal detention center that happens to be located in Tacoma is because this is the center that is closest to Seattle and it's one of the largest on the west coast. Are we happy about it? No. And there's some federal policies that take place that are pretty horrible. There is a minimum bed requirement that they have at the federal level that is tied to a congressional appropriation. So I think it's somewhere around 40,000 per 40,000 people per day they want locked up in these detention centers across the United States. If you find yourself in this center, the adjudication process, or in English, how long it takes you to see a judge and get through the process can be anywhere from six to nine months or even more, even for the most minor offenses. Most of the people who are there are not violent criminals. The people who are there come from all over the world. I know someone from the Ukraine who was there because his green card got messed up. So I wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to go on the record to understand what's there and what isn't. The whole idea of me getting names of ICE officers and calling them out isn't going to change federal policy. What we need to do is to participate in local government so when the gerrymandering of Congress goes on again, and it will, that we're able to wisely redraw districts so that the number of people who vote in elections reflects who actually gets voted in. The current administration and the makeup of this congressional delegation of Congress right now is not going to be inclined to do anything about federal detention centers. In fact, they want to lock more people up. So what we can do as people in local level is participate in local government because that will have an impact on federal government. We can continue to use our voices to make sure that people are being treated fairly and with respect. But I wish I could tell you that I control the actions of ICE. That's coming out of the federal government and they're going to do what they're going to do for right now. So all we can do right now is make sure that we can do what we can locally and control how we treat people. We need to speak out, but political grandstanding isn't going to change anything. We have to be practical. We have to be strategic. And we have to talk about actions that can actually help people. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I agree with uh, uh, Marilyn about this. Um, but we have to realize now, I think that it is obvious for everybody here, that this is a very complicated issue. It's not very simple. And that it has a different levels that comes from the local all the way to the international. <clears throat> And many times we just don't uh, connect the dots. Like for instance, we have a lot of Mexicans coming here looking for jobs in agricultural sectors. Why is that they are here? Is because they are looking for better salaries? No, it's because they are looking for uh, their only salaries. But why is that they don't have salaries? Because the US has a policy to support the American so-called family farm, which ends up with the subsidies that it is, doesn't go to American farm. It goes to the multinational corporations that manage all of the agriculture of the US. But what is the impact? It becomes that the grains are so inexpensive that when we export them to Mexico, that most of the peasants in Mexico, now they cannot make a living. They are the ones who migrate. So it's not I, because they want to, it's because they are forced to. I'm going to, I'm going to ask everyone to please provide a question and because we have only like 15 minutes left, otherwise other folks won't get to ask their questions. Well, my question is, how are we going to connect all of the efforts that go from the local, us, which is not easy, all the way to the decision makers that are going to provoke these immigrations that otherwise wouldn't, we wouldn't have because they would have, and nobody really wants to migrate forcefully. So how are we going to connect all of our efforts at the different levels? That is my question. If no one else wants to speak, I'll take it, but go ahead. <laughs> Rich, won't you? I mean, so it's a, it's a really important question because there, the conversations about immigration really address issues like trade. Um, and actually, just as a side note, connecting the old, I rem, one of the questions earlier, I remember being in Arizona years ago, um, and uh, we held a community forum, and uh, I was living there at the time, <laughs> and uh, uh, there were pro and uh, anti-immigrant folks um, in a room having a dialogue about immigration, 
And uh, what was striking was how the conversation wound up shifting towards trade policies. Um, as uh, you know, a guy who had moved to Arizona from Detroit because of, he lost his work and, in the auto industry, wound up having an interesting conversation with a, um, a Mexican immigrant who lost his livelihood in, uh, in Mexico. Um, you know, which then speaks to broader conversations because, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and one of the reasons Trump won this election was because um, his position on trade. Um, so, uh, which, you know, whatever you think about that, um, it's, you know, has lots of different impacts in immigrant communities. Um, so, having said that, I, I would just emphasize the importance of relationships. So here in Washington State, there are broad networks of um, communities and organizations coming together, um, having much deeper conversations about what advocacy can look like, how movements come together. In some ways, um, the nature of what's happening here at the federal government um, is, uh, is raising the stakes on different movements coming together and having more, more important, deeper conversations about how our issues intersect. So whether it's the, the women's movement or the immigrant rights movement, or the environmental movement. Um, the Northwest Detention Center also happens to be built on a Superfund site, apparently. Um, um, how these different conversations are coming together, I think, um, will be very important and something that has to be nurtured in a very intentional way, because uh, uh, the last thing we need is to, is to fall back in our different silos uh, with regard to advocacy, and we need to think more consciously about how, how these issues fit together. Thank you. Before other responses and other questions, uh, our mayor has to leave in about six minutes. So if there is any of you who have a burning question for her, go ahead. And I'll come back to this question. I don't need to come back to it. I'm not tall enough for this, so. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, <laughs> afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, I have a couple questions. One is probably more towards Marilyn and Melissa. Uh, Marilyn, you talked about this idea of avoiding gentrification when you're supporting um, immigrant communities and that culture. And I'm, I'm really interested in the connection you made between supporting an immigration culture and also kind of that conflict to avoid gentrification. And perhaps with Melissa's experience in Dayton, you can talk to it as well. How, how does that work? Um, I'm a native from Tacoma. I live now, I've lived in Seattle for the last oh dear lord, 15 years. Um, and I, I've seen the areas and the neighborhoods up there change, and it makes me proud to be from Tacoma to see and connect with someone who realizes that issue. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to more about how you see to battle that. And then the other one's more for Liz and Rich in that as a teacher, I feel like my job is to create empathy through storytelling. I'm wondering if you have any resources for me. Um, the, the community I teach is very much a privileged white, um, bubbled in their community, and my only way sometimes to reach them is through that storytelling. So I'm just wondering in your resources that you might have. So, so let me try to do this briefly. So when we talk about gentrification, I would describe it as two tracks. But it typically starts with a neighborhood that is run down, where rents are pretty low and even and, and very, very affordable. And I often say that a neighborhood should not be considered affordable because it's dangerous and it's run down. Now, when we talk about wanting to revitalize neighborhoods, however, we have to respect the fact that there are communities that have been there for a long time. At the same time, as I say about Hilltop, for example, Hilltop can have nice things too. Why shouldn't they have a full service grocery store? Why shouldn't they have light rail? Why shouldn't they have more amenities that other neighborhoods have? But when you do that, you know you inadvertently push property prices up and sometimes inadvertently push people out. Sometimes elders, sometimes communities of color that have been there for a long time. So we have to make sure that as we're improving neighborhoods that we're being very mindful of the culture that exists there, making sure that we're keeping a good stock of affordable housing available and not trying to just bring everything brand shiny and new and wipe out the culture and history. The second track is the Lincoln neighborhood, for example. Vietnamese, other Asian groups have owned businesses and restaurants and have been there for a long time. And as we talk about revitalizing the Lincoln district, we don't want to put a shiny facade on every business and take away what I call the beautiful cultural patina of what's already there. We want better services, we want new utilities, we want upgraded streets, but we also want people who've been there for a long time to do a better job of caring for their storefronts. And so it's really finding a balance of saying that maintaining the cultural integrity is gonna be the center point of any upgrade, 
but we also want to make sure that we're adhering to the idea of that we can all have nice things too. So I hope that answers your question. And, I, and for that, I have to run, you guys. I apologize. Thank you for the honor of letting me be here, and let's keep up the fight. So I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead. Thank you. I'll talk a little bit about our experience in Dayton because I think it is somewhat similar here to Tacoma, but also very distinctly different, particularly being um, a Rust Belt city that has um, a much larger African-American population than you do here in Tacoma. And so Dayton is incredibly segregated. And it um, historically has been so, and unfortunately continues um, until this day. And, and there's a river that runs through it, and there's a highway that goes along that. So we have both the natural geographical barriers as well as the man-made ones that, that divide our city. Um, and so there are neighborhoods within Dayton, um, and, and really the majority of Dayton, honestly, has experienced um, a huge downturn as far as um, stabilization, particularly when the housing market bubble burst. And so we have quite amount of blight in Dayton, and it is uh, very, very easy to purchase a home for $10,000 or less in, in our city. And so there's, there's also a lot of opportunity with that um, related to um, someone who's entrepreneurial, someone who has a little bit of cash and can come in and purchase these homes. And so I think that that's a real challenge and balance for particularly the city of Dayton because many of these properties end up in tax arrears and, and become uh, properties that the city of Dayton has to manage. And so how do we make sure that there continues to be equitable access to all of these properties um, so that whether I've been in Dayton all of my life and, and I can now purchase the, the home that's next door that needs a lot of renovation or am I a newcomer and I'm looking to buy up the entire neighborhood. Um, and so I think that's something that, that our particularly our community and planning development is, is challenged with um, looking at, at all of that. Um, but I also want to give you one particular example from a neighborhood that's Old North Dayton. And Old North Dayton is um, it, kind of like our historical immigrant neighborhood. Uh, it was settled in the early 1900s from five Eastern European countries and has really maintained a very, very proud ethnic identity um, from being from these five European countries. And they have these flags and this gateway and, and um, just a lot of cultural pride in that neighborhood. And our Hiska Turkish community um, has really kind of, I don't, I don't want to say overtaken, but they have um, purchased a lot of homes in this neighborhood. They have revitalized that the, the neighborhood um, to you know, kind of at the early century um, to where you drive down it and it just looks very, very, very distinct. There are... Um, you, you can drive through it and you can pick out which are the Turkish houses because of the fences that they've built, because of the additions that they've put onto their home. And the neighborhood community members have quite honestly, the historic neighborhood uh, has not been welcoming um, to these changes. And the Hiska Turkish community asked to put up the Turkish flag on their thoroughfare and it in, ensued in, in a lot of community tension and eventually the city of Dayton was just like, just put it up, we don't care. Um, and that, that wasn't, quite honestly though, that wasn't the correct approach from the city. Um, we really need to have an understanding of where are these tensions and how do we navigate them so that everyone continues to feel welcomed in their neighborhood despite demographic changes. And I think that's ultimately what is, is a calling of a welcoming community is how do you go deeper into the community so that you can have those difficult conversations and so that the, the historical community um, does not feel as though so um, they're not being pushed out, particularly in Dayton, where um, we already have a, a historical African-American community that has been marginalized and oppressed and who haven't felt welcomed in our community. And so now that we have an initiative that specifically says, oh, we're immigrant friendly, how do you have those conversations around we're trying to create equitable access for everyone? And I think those are very, di very difficult conversations and have to continue to occur. Sorry. Thank you. So we have six minutes, so I'm going to sort of hung, hang on to those. Two short questions, two short answers. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so I wrote my, my question down. I know you guys uh, uh, talked about uh, strategies for uh, creating a more welcoming community uh, for Tacoma. Uh, but does any of those strategies specifically uh, involve uh, <clears throat> social media in any way? 
uh, if you look on social media, you'll see like there's a lot of, uh, you know, any any news, anything will spread like digital wildfire. Uh, it can be something very uh, beneficiary or very negative towards uh, the immigrant community. So um, if you guys have a, you know, answer or a comment on that, I appreciate that. Thank you. Your answers. Well, I wouldn't say we're experts at social media, but we certainly uh, try to get a lot of, of information out there, and uh, there are a number of informal groups that have started that uh, have created Facebook pages. So there's a, an interfaith group that started in Tacoma in support of immigrants and refugees. There is, um, uh, you know, the Northwest Detention Center Resistance Group has a Facebook page. So there's a lot of people using social media as a way to, to share information and to mobilize people. So I think uh, it is a great tool and, and we'll keep looking at how we can do that better. I view that in the context of all the different tools available. Um, it's important that a city, an organization, other communities uh, figure out like what they want to be good at <laughs> and then like, invest the resources in making it work. Um, and you're right, social media can be very viral um, and helpful in a lot of ways, but it can also you know, be the source of bad rumors. It could also be the source of bad news. Um, and then uh, just quickly um, to the question you had asked earlier, um, I'm a fan of teaching tolerance out of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And, uh, um, and then there are other um, tools coming from the Sikh Coalition, um, Muslim advocates and others speaking to uh, some of the experiences of, of other um, minority religious communities. For the Welcome Dayton initiative, we do have a Facebook page, and the city of Dayton actually hired a uh, social media specialist a few years ago, and so I think um, if any of you are city government officials in the room, I think having that particular person within city government to monitor a page and continue to put out information th through all different departments and channels has been incredibly helpful for us. Thank you, last question. So I had to reframe my question, um, but I want to just put this out here. It's really hard to have a dialogue about this if we're asking questions to a panel when a lot of us are um, working in the immigrant rights community already here in Tacoma. I'm part of a group, Tacoma Migrant Justice, and um, I am also from Tacoma. Um, so we are already doing this work. Um, and my question was for the mayor. Um, it's important for us to understand our legacy. Um, I come from a genocidal past um, that, that doesn't begin when the border was developed. So um, while I think it's very important to call out microaggressions that happen, um, it's also very difficult for us to have conversations as people of color who are allies within this work. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that that pain that happened here, maybe why she left, I don't know. Um, it, we can't run away from that anymore. We need to start having tough conversations within our community as people of color. This isn't gonna be a question because this is a dialogue. Yeah, this absolutely. is a dialogue, this is the message that we've been getting from this forum. Um, and it is very, very important mm -hmm. that not this, for um, committees not to just be standalone committees within the city government, for, but for us to be actively participating and talking to each other. So I apologize, I can't ask no, that question fantastic. because she isn't here. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I want to acknowledge that a microaggression happened to her, she reacted, and then we weren't able to talk about what we really need to talk about, meaning solidarity among people of color. We need to look at our legality and the privileges that we hold, or the privileges that we don't have, and start working together um, across our differences, um, and not shut that down. Because I can also say too, I can shut down a conversation too, and say I become, come from a genocidal past, and I'm leaving. You know, I, and that's not going to get us anywhere. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, to my knowledge, she left for other reasons because she had told me she was going to leave at 120. Um, but this is, I started this morning by saying this is about dialogue and conversation, and I want to make sure you understand this. This is a very hard work, as our speaker uh, pointed out. This is not something that affects one community or one group of people. It affects everyone involved. And as I mentioned last night at another gathering um, and this morning, 
I've been here 40 years and I don't think this topic ever will get old. It has nothing to, the, with the, to do with the election of one person over the other. It's been here for 200 years and it will be unfortunately with us for a nation of immigrants. There has been a lot of oppression of different groups. And the more we talk about it, the more we can get at least closure maybe on some of these issues. But closure is not what we seek for. What we seek for is, is justice, and I think everyone is involved in that, in that narrative. And hopefully there will be more conversations and more activities as, an, as one small part of the city. We will be carrying this conversation throughout the year. We will have other folks coming, on, coming to ca campus. And what I invite everyone is that when we do the, the standalone events is for everyone to participate so we can have a dialogue. To be honest with you, all the details need to come from you. It can't come from us. The one thing you will learn from migration scholars is at some point they run out of statistics. We will run out of statistics and then the experience is really important because that narrative is not in the numbers. The, the narrative is much bigger than that. And what you heard today is a beginning of that. And I hope you, you found the information and this beginning point exciting, invigorating, and we can move on and begin to not move on to a resolution necessarily, but to move on with ideas about how to encounter something that we have inherited after hundreds of years and we are still trying to figure out how to solve it. I want to thank you for being with us. I want to thank the panelists for a lovely conversation, an informative conversation. I, I know you have busy lives, so being here and being part of this conversation means you care about this topic, and I thank you for it, and I look forward to having you in other events of the Urban Studies Program. I'm grateful for all you do in this city on behalf of everyone. Thank you.